one. Welcome everybody. Um, great to see all of you. Um, we have two talks here for our session on reading Victorian attention. Um, so the first in a moment is going to be given um, by uh, Rebecca Spence. She's going to be speaking on unseen sound and the aesthetics of attention in George Eliot's The Men on the Floss. And then after her, we'll be hearing from Amanda Vernon, uh, who will be speaking on attending to the dead, George MacDonald and reading as necromantic conversation. Uh, both Becky and Amanda are PhD students here in the department at Lancaster. Um, and we're very much looking forward to hearing from both of uh, you today. Um, just uh, to introduce myself quickly, I'm going to be chairing this session. Uh, my name is Mark Knight and I'm a member of staff here in the department. So we're here from uh, Becky and then Amanda. And then once we've done so, we'll have an opportunity for questions. So when we get to questions at the end, um, uh, you can use the little hand function. Um, if you want to, to kind of raise your hand and ask a question or if that's causing you difficulty for any reason, feel free to type something into the chat and we can come over to all of you then. Uh, final thing just to say, I guess before Becky we start is um, I'll, I'll leave my picture on just so that you don't feel that you're you know, speaking to an entirely blank screen. Um, uh, but otherwise, great to have you and Amanda with us. So Becky, let's pass over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. And um, thanks again to John for uh, inviting Amanda and me to speak today. Um, I'm aware of time uh, so, and I don't want to cut into Amanda's time too much, so I think I'll just uh, jump in at the beginning. Um, OK. In her 1856 essay, The Natural History of German Life, George Eliot made a striking defence of e uh, fiction's ethical value. A picture of human life such as a great artist can give, she wrote, surprises even the trivial and the selfish into that attention to what is apart from themselves, which may be called the raw material of moral sentiment. Passing Eliot's logic here, great art encourages a transformative kind of attention that also constitutes the basis of sympathy. And if this particular mode is of attention is for Eliot, a primary feature of the novel as a literary form. Today I want to think about how attention figures aesthetically in Eliot's novels themselves. Whilst Eliot draws on the visual aesthetic register in this quotation, a picture of human life, today I want to consider the curious aesthetics of auditory attention in The Mill on the Floss, and specifically the kind of attention that arises when sound is heard from an unseen source, which is also known as acousmatic listening. Thinking about the aesthetics of auditory attention is a challenge, not least because attention by its essence seems resistant to the, to the kind of reflective work required to replicate its experiential quality in language. If whilst absorbed in a state of attentiveness, we try and step back and reflect on the quality of this attention, if we quite try and capture its peculiar sensibility, then inevitably, and uh, as we know well, attention spell is immediately broken uh, and it slips away. We're no longer paying attention. Yet I want to suggest that it's precisely this kind of equivocality that rendered auditory attention such a fertile aesthetic site for Eliot in The Mill and the Floss and elsewhere in her writing. There is, I want to suggest, a specifically specific kind of voluntary directedness involved in auditory, in auditory attention as Eliot figures it, and particularly when sound is isolated from its source. So the episodes of this kind in Eliot's novels repeatedly figure attention to unseen sound as an encounter that verges on a kind of imminent transcendence, which goes beyond quotidian sights of experience. I want to pray see the readings of The Mill and the Floss that follow by briefly situating Eliot's dramatisation of acousmatic listening as part of a broader reconceptualization of attention during the 19th century, where sound became a principal forum for scientific experiments in theorising attention. Insofar as Eliot demonstrates an aesthetic interest in the procedures of acousmatic listening, she is writing in trad tradition that had long privileged the separation of the senses and presumably the heightened attention this generates as a means for expanding the parameters of consciousness. Sound coming from outside the, the field of vision, from somewhere beyond, has long held a privileged place in the Western imagination, reaching back to ancient traditions. We might think of the Pythian Oracle at Delphi, 
where supplicants would listen to prophecies that the high, high priestess spoke from a subterranean cavern below the temple. Or we might turn to the apocryphal story of Greek philosopher Pythagoras, who is believed to have lectured his pupils from behind a veil in order to train and refine their faculty of attention. 2000 years later, the separation of the senses was revivified in a 19th century drive towards cultivating auditory attention, a broad cultural project with which Eliot was deeply familiar. Attention posed a significant challenge to the indomitable Victorian drive to classify and categorise experience. And this was, I think, precisely its appeal. The challenge was met by a cross-disciplinary effort to lay claim to attention, to try and empirically understand its working. Both George Henry Lewis, Eliot's long-term partner, and James Sully, a social and intellectual ally of Lewis and Eliot, were psychologists interested in the effects of sound on the embodied mind. And other key figures who experimented with splitting the sensorium, isolating, from the eye, isolating the eye from the ear, to understand how it might affect the quality or concentration of auditory attention, included physicists Hermann von Helmholtz, John Tyndall and Ernest Mack, the work of her, whom we know from Eliot's diaries, notebooks and letters that she read and admired. By the work of these thinkers, questions of auditory attention were introduced to a broader public audience in the 19th century. In particular, James Sully's recent experiments in the senses is an article that serves as a summation of the broader cultural logic, logic of the scientific project of sound and attention, which came to recognise close, attentive listening as an embodied practice that was also the mark of a refined aesthetic sense. Sully wrote in the article that with considerable discipline in attention, as he puts it, different tones within the same musical note could be recognised and, quote, may be detected even in this close fusion of elements once the mind is aware of their existence and consequently lies in wait for them, so to speak, end quote. The emphasis Sully places on directed attention seems to conflate uh, an aesthetic and a social imperative, drawing them together to illustrate a wider Victorian attitude, wherein sound came, as Gillian Beer des describes, to assume, quote, the status of ideal function that sight had, had earlier held. Listening itself, the faculty that governs the reception of sound, was to offer similarly expansive potential in terms of social, moral and aesthetic progress. And so when Sully concludes via Helmholtz in the article that, quote, a purposed act of attention will frequently extend the borders of conscious life by discovering impressions heretofore obscure and unknown, end quote, he is as much talking about the emancipation emancipatory promise of listening in terms of the social fabric as much as individual experience. Sully raises the expansive question, attention, what new spheres of experience might unfold. Sully doesn't dwell on resolving or further defining the form this abstract extension of consciousness might take, or indeed what kind of impressions might be made discoverable by a purposed act of attention. Eliot, I want to suggest, her, her novels embody a heuristic working out of these abstract speculations via listening practices that similarly isolate sight from sound. So the first episode to, uh, of listening to unseen sound that I want to consider in The Mill on the Floss takes place when Maggie Tulliver enters into a period of adolescent renunciation following the financial ruin of her father. Maggie is drawn to an old annotated copy of Thomas A. Kempis's The Imitation of Christ. The passage from A. Kempis that Eliot transcribes urges abnegation of the self and earthly cares, advocating instead an economy of listening wherein one ignores the whisperings of the world and receives instead the whispers of the divine voice. As Maggie becomes absorbed in A. Kempis's spiritual counsel, a strange thrill of awe passes through her, and I'm quoting here from the passage, as if she had been awakened in the night by a strain of solemn music, 
telling of beings whose soul had been astir whilst hers were in stupor, were in stupor, sorry. She went from one brown mark to another where the quiet hand seemed to point, hardly conscious that she was reading, seeming rather to listen. Elliot reconfigures Maggie's act of reading here as an act of listening. Maggie does not merely see words on a page, but hears an unseen voice. She perceives, quote, a voice out of the far off Middle Ages, end quote. The disembodied voice of the medieval monk is akin to music and stirs on a primarily speaking to her lack of direction, purpose and agency. The voice proposes an attitude to both life and listening that appeals to Maggie during the messiness of her preemptive grief for her ruined father and the bewilderment of adolescence. Method and matter coalesce as Maggie receives a campus's practically ascetic but emotionally passionate message via an ascetic mode, fervently listening to a far echoing acousmatic voice without body. Certainly, Elliot infers that listening opens up different forms of consciousness than reading, but it does not follow that listening is therefore a less consciously attentive act than reading. Instead, it seems to encourage a differently profound mode of attention. Maggie's reception of a campus speaks to Brandon LaBelle's suggestion that, quote, the acousmatic carries forward the tracings of a voice that leaves behind the material world, end quote. Yet if the material connection between the voice of the old monk and the body that emits it is suspended, Eliot ref refuses to suggest the same about the body that perceives this voice. The material world is very much participative in Maggie's embodied mode of attention. Eliot draws on the physiological register to emphasise Maggie's response to the voice that is flashing through her. She finds herself greedily devouring the dialogues, panting in her ecstatic reaction to the long lingering vibrations of the voice. Attentive listening to unseen sound as Eliot dramatises it affects perception in strange ways. Acousmatic listening momentarily of temporality and memory. In Adam Bede, this kind of listening generates a glimpse into the future. Dinah Morris's perception of a loud, unseen sound next door prompts, with painful intensity, a foretelling of Hetty Sorrel in a thorny thicket of sin and sorrow, so that Dinah's sympathetic divination produces an almost verbatim prophecy of Hetty's later account of abandoning her child in a wood. In the mill on the floss, the voice of Thomas Akempis reaches across the temporal divide between orator and auditor, and temporality is rendered fleetingly synchronous, simultaneously reaching back into deep history, becoming intensively present and providing a future script for Maggie to follow. The quality of Maggie's attention is such that time seems to bend back on itself, becoming inscribed in the disembodied voice of the, of the monk to which Maggie listens. For Maggie, listening seems to establish a thread that both stitches together and removes distance in a temporal instant. Sound becomes, quote, the direct communication of a human soul's belief and experience, end quote. And as a result of this implied suspension of sound and vision, Maggie's attention is orientated to that which is apart from herself, the kind of attention that Eliot considered great art could produce. The long-standing cultural assumption of a relationship between sound, particularly musical sound, and transcendence is, I think, complicated by Eliot's insistence on the corporal reception of sound, emphasised in the sheer physicality of Maggie's response. Brian Kane suggests that, generally speaking, acousmatic listening offers, quote, access to transcendental spheres different in kind from the purely sonic effects, a way of listening to essence, truth, profundity, ineffability or interiority, end quote. Eliot engages with this idea of transcendent essence in both Maggie and Dinah's experiences of acousmatic listening, 
But if Elliot affiliates this mode of attention with a kind of transcendence, she simultaneously refuses to dismiss the material conditions out of which this transcendence is born. She doesn't disregard, but indeed rather champions, the primacy of embodied cognition in producing this sense of transcendence, emphasising attention as an embodied practice that is not only responsive to external stimuli, but is itself creative. It's another voice from the past, that of Maggie's childhood friend, Philip Wakeham, which later challenges the veracity of her renunciatory stance. Philip's reintroduction to Maggie's life stirs the sensibility that she has sought to diminish through her incomplete interpretation of asceticism. His words set Maggie's discontent vibrating as it used to do, again emphasising the psychophysical form of Maggie's listening material felt response to the invasion of sound upon the tissues of her body overlaps with the effect of sound's capacity to extend the usual perceptual parameters of temporality, memory and consciousness. Maggie's request to Philip when she beseeches, oh sing me something, conveys that this impulse abides still. Throughout her life, Maggie's aural sensibility has provided a channel for her to momentarily transcend the strictures of her environment and the obstacles to her freedom. Her memory of the midnight chant of the church choir, for instance, the present morning above the level of common days. Her request that Philip sings something from their childhood at Lawton speaks to the endurance of this emancipatory method, as well as the deep connection between sound and memory. Significantly, Maggie describes a particular listening technique by which she engaged with these childhood listening sessions. She says, when we had the drawing room all to ourselves and I put my apron over my head to listen. Maggie adopts this same technique when Philip begins to sing in the Red Deeps, burying her head in her hands. This self-directed listening practice at once speaks to Maggie's nostalgia for these snatched moments of relative freedom during her childhood. But it also signals how she has in the past and in this moment continues to direct her listening. So that, it, so that it acts as a technique that, that does not rely on ecclesiastical teaching, social conformity or the other voices of discipline that are imposed on her throughout the novel. Aggie is often instructed to listen by those around her and often this instruction is also a chastisement of her propensity towards willfulness. As a child, Tom tells her, now, now Maggie, you must listen before admonishing her for being a naughty girl. And Philip beseeches her, listen to me, before offering to curate and therefore regulate her intellectual development. These moments of instructed listening emphasise the chorus of reproach and derision that encroach upon Maggie's ear in various phases of her life, as well as underscoring the dynamics of power and dominion that are at play in the utterance and reception of speech acts. Maggie's momentary ability to reinstate her agency in her self-directed reception of Philip's voice signals a small but significant act of defiance. It's an act of autonomy as well as rec receptivity, escape as well as assimilation to the world outside, an experience that momentarily unfixes Maggie from temporal, economic and social limitations. In this moment, Maggie establishes what is for her an, an intuitive form of training and self-command over the primary faculty that connects, connects her with the expansiveness of her sensibility and its relation to the world. For Maggie, listening to Philip's voice without seeing him momentarily suspends the division between her consciousness and the world, and the gap is attenuated through sympathy to grasp towards the meaning or value of the sound that Maggie perceives. And Elliot offers no further theorization on Maggie's internal psychological state through free and free indirect discourse. And I think this demonstrates an aesthetic privilege, privileging of this practice of listening over the content of what is heard. Mm -hmm. 
That is to say, it is the technique involved in acousmatic listening itself that signals how, under certain circumstances, Maggie structures her field of attention so that specific sound events become perceptually centralised. Maggie's acousmatic perception is inherently bound to the memory of her childhood and through her bodily positioning, burying her head in her hands and obscuring her vision, she reactivates the somatic conditions by which she listened to Philip during their childhood. In doing so, she makes her childhood memory imminent, that Maggie actively directs the listening experience rather than passively receives it, further points to how Elliot marks out the procedures of this conditioned listening technique from alternative forms of listening. Suspending the relationship between the eye and the ear and thus heightening auditory attention produces an assimilation of somatic and psychological memory. James Sully, as we've seen, proposed that directed attention is a voluntary act and proceeds according to the influence of some practical end. Yet Maggie's attention, the voluntariness of which is emphasised in this scene, is not directly associated with a quantifiable practical end, as Sully suggests. Instead, it signals the refined quality of Maggie's ear, her understanding that distance might be proximity, her developing sense that discipline may not equate to denying the sensuousness of the body. Tragically, of course, for Maggie, this is a revelatory attention out of time. But Eliot continued to navigate the kinds of world that could be apprehended through the extension of the ear. She repeatedly returned to this listening practice in later novels, perhaps in service to her commitment to understanding what the raw material of moral sentiment might sound like. And that's the end. Cool, Becky, that's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. You'll just have to imagine uh, in your head right now, everybody kind of clapping away. <laughs> so, uh, but no, it was really, really good. Thank you. Um, uh, Amanda, let's pass over straight to you, um, if we can, and let you um, go ahead with your talk, and then we can take questions on both of them at the end. So, Amanda, over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks, Becky. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, I think hopefully there'll be some good connections between our papers. It seems like there's some crossover, so that'll be fun to talk about. Um, right, I will jump in as well. George MacDonald was, it seems, haunted by the dead, dead writers in particular. Throughout his work, he claims that reading is an act that has the potential to raise a dead writer life. For MacDonald, this resurrection may only be achieved through a particular kind of open and attentive reading. There is, in his mind, a kind of magic about all of this, for he writes that the words of a book are like the necromantic spell that calls up the spirit of the departed writer, thus bringing him or her into conversation with the reader. The increased interest in spiritualism and the occult in the mid to late 19th century meant that for many Victorians, conversation with the intriguing possibility. It also created divisions between Christians who regarded their faith as compatible with this new spiritual phenomenon and those who saw it as a threat to orthodox belief. At the same time, the rise of nonconformity and the increasing prominence of the Catholic Church led some clergy to feel that members of their flock might defect to other religious groups. It was, as Alison Winter notes, a time of prevailing anxiety about spiritual influence. Given the fact that MacDonald was not only a novelist and literary scholar, but also a Christian theologian and preacher, the question arises as to what precisely his intention was in employing a spiritualist register in his discussions of reading. This paper claims that MacDonald's model of reading as a necromantic conversation is not a demonstration of his support of spiritualist practice, nor is it simply a figure of speech. It is rather a way of presenting reading as an alternative to spiritualism. There are several reasons why I believe he's doing this, but with the time that we have today, I'd like to focus on just one of these reasons, his concern about spiritual influence. And the notion that books may act as a medium connecting the living and the dead is one that has intrigued literary critics and historians for some time. For Leah Price, it is the material book that links, quote, successive readers across the line that divides the living from the dead, end quote. 
For others, such as the oft-quoted Stephen Greenblatt, it is the act of reading itself that seems to provide an opportunity to speak with the dead. The fact that this subject continues to fascinate scholars after decades of discussion raises the question as to what it is about reading books that invites us to think of it as a way of communing with the dead. Is it, as Deirdre Lynch suggests, the readerly tendency towards the personification of books, something that often involves an emotional connection? Or might it have to do with an awareness of the complexity of interpreting someone's words, a complexity that's made even more apparent when we're faced with the barrier of death? Or could it simply be that it's a convenient metaphor, given that most of the writers we study are dead? Well, MacDonald too frequently writes of reading as a way of connecting with the dead. And for him, it's the commonalities he identifies between reading and conversation that shape his notion of reading as a mode of communing with the dead. According to the philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer, a conversation is, quote, a process of coming to an understanding, end quote, something that happens only if the parties involved are openly and attentively listening to one another. The need for openness in conversation means that there is also a certain unpredictability about how the conversation will go or what the result might be. According to Gadamer, quote, the more genuine its conduct lies within the will of either partner. This means that conversational understanding, or the lack thereof, is not in our control, but is, says Gadamer, like an event that happens to us. For this reason, a conversation might be set, said to have, according to Gadamer, a spirit of its own. Openness, attention, unpredictability, and the presence of a distinct spirit. Qualities of conversation that are, as Gadamer recognizes, also present in the event of reading a text. Although he was writing about a century before Gadamer, MacDonald's description of his idea of reading as conversation is strikingly similar to that of the German philosopher. Articulating the idea of open and attentive listening in terms of reading, MacDonald writes that through close, silent, patient study, the reader is enabled to enter into an understanding with the spirit of the departed poet sage. Elsewhere, he not only affirms the close attention a good reader pays when he thinks seriously about what his book says, but also highlights a positive element of reading's unpredictability when he claims that the attentive reader is always finding in the book some beauty or excellence or aid he had not found before. MacDonald's attentive reader is therefore a rereader whose interactions with dead writers are not simply passing encounters, but extended conversations in which she remains open to increased understanding, even if the event of understanding is not guaranteed. Turning to his 1883 novel, Donald Grant, we find MacDonald extending this idea of conversation with the dead into an argument for reading as an alternative to spiritualism. MacDonald's alert to the various reasons why people attended seances. Sometimes they wanted emotional connection to a loved one who had died. Sometimes they were looking for evidence of a spiritual world. Sometimes they wanted advice. But in this paper, I'm focusing on the strand of his argument that relates to seeking advice or guidance from the dead. And I should just note in passing that in his realist novels, MacDonald tends to ventriloquize a little bit through his characters, which has led to accusations of him preaching, which I think is accurate, but it's useful definitely for understanding some of his ideas. Um, so in this novel, the main character, Donald Grant, affirms the reasonableness of a longing for personal communication with this or that one of the greatest who have lived before him. He then goes on to argue that, quote, Instead of mocking you with an airy semblance of the dead's bodily forms and the murmur of a few doubtful words from their lips, reading places in your hands a key to their inmost thoughts. While MacDonald was open to the possibility of making a connection with the other side, this is evident from his personal letters and his published writing, he was concerned that whomever or whatever one was making contact with could actually be someone or something other than they appeared. This could be something diabolical, or it could be the spirit of a deceased human pretending to be someone that they're not, but there's no guarantee. So the doubtful words Donald references are doubtful in the sense of being incoherent, but also in the sense of coming from a dubious source. In short, this kind of necromantic conversation is unreliable and possibly dangerous spiritually. Reading, on the other hand, provides a sort of direct access to the mind of the dead writer. For, according to MacDonald, the thing that qualifies a book as a book is, quote, that it has a soul, the mind in it of him who wrote the book, end quote. 
Although some interpretation will be required, McDonald re remains confident that his conversational manner of reading is the best way to determine the dead writer's thoughts. While he acknowledges that some might not view this as personal communication, he maintains that it is actually a far deeper and more personal connection than one might find in a seance. He believed that when we come into contact, we come into contact with the being of a man when we hear him pour forth his thoughts of the things he likes best to think about into the year of the universe. And for him, it is precisely in this position that reading places the reader. Thus, a real conversation with the dead is in fact only possible through reading, but not just any kind of reading. The relationship between living reader and dead writer is one of openness and intimacy for the contact occurs when the reader hears, a word that implies attentive listening, the writer's most cherished thoughts. Donald's further claim that there is more of the marvelous in an old library than ever any magic could work, hints at the idea that there is more to seeking conversation with the dead than a simple guarantee of good counsel or guidance. An old library is a place that, by virtue of its books, is filled with the marvelous or supernatural. It is not, however, the physical presence of the books that makes it a location for the marvelous, but rather the use of the imagination on the parts of both reader and, years before, the dead writer. MacDonald writes that, in books, we not only have store of all results of the imagination, but in them we may behold her, the imagination, embodying before our very eyes in music of speech, in wonder of words, till her work stands finished before us. Books then not only contain the end result of the writer's imaginative vision or thought, but also afford an opportunity for the reader to witness that vision materializing before her very eyes. This dynamic process indicates that the imagination is characterized by vitality, a vitality that allows for the repeated embodying of the dead writer's ideas with each reading of the text. Not only does the notion of the repeated embodiment of something intangible hint at the repeated manifestations of spirits from the dead, but it also points to the role of the imagination in necromantic reading. It is not only the dead writer's imagination, but the reader's imagination too that plays a crucial part in literary resurrection. For it is through the sounds and meanings of the words on the page, a description that implies the necessity of a reader to hear and make meaning, that the idea of the dead writer is made manifest. Reading is not, therefore, simply a passive observation of the dead writer's imaginative vision, but an active engagement of the reader's own imagination with the writer's own words, or speech, as MacDonald writes. The privileging of literary imagination over spiritualist manifestation is no secular attempt to replace the possibility of spiritual reality with an imaginative or aesthetic alternative. It is rather an indicator of the spiritual significance that MacDonald places upon the imagination and consequently reading. For him, a wise imagination is the presence of the spirit of God, a claim that not only asserts the intrinsically spiritual nature of the imagination, but also locates its working within the triune life of the Christian God. The connection MacDonald makes between the Holy Spirit and the imagination demonstrates the spiritual importance he places upon the latter, but it also has significant bearing upon how we understand his notion of necromantic reading. Reading is superior to necromancy, not only because it safeguards readers against bad advice from dubious sources, but because through the spirit-filled imagination, it offers spiritual insight and divine guidance. In the Christian tradition, the Holy Spirit is, among other things, a guide who gives internal direction or illumination that enables a person to see and know things beyond the of physical sight. Picking up on this idea, MacDonald writes that a wise imagination is the best guide that man or woman can have, a claim about guidance that's not limited to moral or religious matters. The imagination is not for him an optional extra in human cognition, but is at work in every sphere of human activity, including those areas more commonly associated with reason or empirical inquiry, such as science or mathematics. To consider the act of reading in light of this theological conception of the imagination affords a clear understanding of MacDonald's claims about the guidance dead writers may give, as well as the notion that an old library possesses a marvelous or supernatural quality. If the Holy Spirit is present in the imaginations of both the living reader and the dead writer, then a library filled with old books becomes the locus for a marvelous encounter with God himself. 
Thus, the idea is not simply a figurative or aesthetic claim about old books or libraries, but is rather an assertion about a particular spiritual reality. The divine direction afforded by necromantic reading is not a channeling of information from God to the reader via the writer in the way that a medium might channel the voice of the dead. This is because it requires the particular and unique involvement of all parties. The writer uses her imagination to communicate her ideas or vision. The reader uses his imagination to engage with the writer's words and the Holy Spirit illumines and guides them both. This is vital to note because although the Holy Spirit does direct, he does not do so in a manner that overrides or violates the freedom of the writer or the reader. This is an answer then to 19th century anxieties about spiritual influence, particularly the concerns that people were having about mind control and manipulation associated practices. There is then a similarity between God's refusal to coerce or dominate those he has created and the open attention to the other that characterizes necromantic reading. The significance of the similarity is heightened when one considers that the spirit's process of direction is, in fact, more akin to a conversation than divine dictation. Although Gadamer's focus is more upon language than imagination, his articulation of the relationship between freedom and unpredictability in conversation is helpful here. He writes, the way one word follows another, with the conversation taking its own twists and reaching its own conclusion, may well be conducted in some way, but the partners conversing are far less the leaders of it than the led. That those in conversation are less the leaders than the led, rather than completely so, indicates that there remains some agency on the parts of those involved. At the same time, the need for openness to the other in conversation is a relinquishment of absolute control. This choice to let go of all control is where the element of unpredictability comes in, not only on the part of the reader who seeks to understand, but on the part of the writer who, according to MacDonald, often feels that his ideas or imaginative visions are given to him from the vast unknown, an unknown in which God is present and at work. Gadamer's conclusion that conversation possesses a spirit of its own is therefore particularly fitting, for the Holy Spirit is, by way of the imagination, a present and active participant in the conversation between dead writer and living reader. The vitality that characterizes necromantic reading is another way in which MacDonald links the imagination with the Holy Spirit. In Christian theology, the spirit is the giver of life. Like the Father and the Son, he is involved with creation, but he also has a particular association with resurrection. The life-giving power of the Spirit is not only creative then, but recreative or resurrective. Given the Spirit's role in resurrection, we can see why, for MacDonald, the dead writer is brought back to life through the working of the Spirit-filled imagination. Unlike necromancy, which is more akin to revivification, and I can never say that word, <laughs> Christian resurrection involves an element of transformation, for it not only promises resurrection, but resurrection into a form that is continuous at some level with the old body, but also radically better. Given the differences between necromancy and Christian resurrection, then, it may be more fitting to term MacDonald's method of reading as resurrective rather than necromantic. This term seems especially suitable when one considers the many parallels between conversational reading and resurrection, parallels that include the need for openness, the need to relinquish control, and the repeated figurative death of the self or ego by choosing to fix one's attention on the other rather than asserting one's own agenda. These qualities are, for MacDonald, inextricably linked with the Holy Spirit, who is the empowering presence that breathes creative and transformative life. Conversational reading may therefore be seen not only as the resurrection of the dead writer, but also as the repeated death and resurrection of the reader as well. Through conversational reading, a person is not only offered reliable guidance, but will, through her metaphorical death and resurrection, be transformed into a better version of herself. At least, this is what MacDonald hopes will happen. This readerly transformation is not simply the result of a sympathetic engagement with a book or an increase in intellectual understanding, but is powered and directed by the Holy Spirit. It is therefore, at its core, a distinctly theological understanding of reading. Through this conception of reading as a resurrective conversation with the dead, MacDonald thus offers an alternative to spiritualism, 
one that he believes to alleviate concerns over dubious spiritual influences, manipulation, and mind control. At the same time, he affords reading, and not just the reading of devotional or explicitly Christian books, but any book that's been the product of a wise imagination. He affords it with a spiritual significance that is quite striking, and one that I would suggest is unique for its time. Thank you. Cool, Amanda, wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, another really good talk. So um, the two of you have kept the time extremely nicely. We've got some time for questions now. Um, so Becky, do you want to put your video back on? Um, and then let's open this up to anyone. So any questions, please raise your hand um, or type it into chat if you'd prefer to do that. And I will do my best to keep an eye on different things here. So questions from anybody. Great, John, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, wonderful papers, wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to formulate, so anyway. I suppose one interesting thing, there's a great line in Corinthians, um, in the King James, our conversation is in heaven. I don't know if you've come across that line. Anyway, so our conversation is in heaven. Um, but that, that may be of some interest or significance, I don't know. What's very interesting, I guess, is partly the question of uh, of how conversation compares and contrasts with dialectic, perhaps, which is a two term thing, as it were, implies, I think, uh, uh, two people speaking, whereas obviously a Trinitarian vision or staging of conversation, whether that be via heaven or because, uh, Amanda, you very frequently spoke or increasingly spoke Trinitarianly, if you like. Um, would seem to suggest a different kind of vision of conversation with three discussants or whatever. Okay, so I'm, I'll give up and uh, uh, see if you guys have got any any thoughts. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think that's that's a that's right, and uh, it's definitely. I think it. I guess it changes changes the um, dynamic of conversation certainly. Um, I'm not sure. I'm. I'm going to look that quotation that you mentioned up from Corinthians. I'm that did not ring a bell, but I am very curious as to um, as to what's going on with that to see connection there uh, that McDonald might have seen. But um, yeah, I'm. I'm not, I'm not quite. I don't know, Becky, if you have anything to add about kind of yeah, dialogue and conversation and. Oh, sorry, no, that's the best way I've said in my real life. I have no frame orientation. <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure it's a very interesting point. Thank you, thank you. Perfect, great, thanks. Anybody else, other questions that anyone would like to raise? Joe, over to you. Um, and John, actually, do you want to put your hand down unless you want to come back for another question in a minute? But in the meantime, uh, Joe, let's hear from you. Hi, I'm going to try and articulate my half-baked thought. Um, the thing that struck me about Amanda's paper, I suppose, is that attention to the other in conversation draws you out of yourself and, and creates something new. It's something kind of... Um, spiritual but also kind of resurrective regenerative life-giving um i was wondering about putting that into conversation with becky's paper in terms of what attention because it doesn't seem to do that for elliot or um when maggie's brought out of herself by her listening there is something maybe regenerative or positive in her conversation or her listening to philip but it it doesn't end well <laughs> it's what I would. So I don't know whether that whether you, that speaks at all to your paper, Becky. Um, yeah. And, Sorry. Yeah. And and, and whether Amanda has any reflections on that as well. So to both of you, and me. Yeah. No. So it's a really good question, and I agree with you. I don't think it is kind of within the arc of the narrative. I don't think it serves a, a necessarily regenerative purpose. Um, 
but I guess was Mill on the Floss ever going to be anything other than a tragedy? You know, it's these kind of moments of relief, I guess, that I think that this this particular form of attention or attentiveness provides, um, but it's obviously not uh, effective enough to change the eventual outcome. <laughs> Uh, does it do good to Maggie though do you think I mean that I know you obviously I know you've written elsewhere about how this attentiveness to listening in other writers of the period is ameliorative it is kind of um makes people better people if they can attend better um yeah. does it make her does it heighten her do you think? well I do I think in the moment it does um I think but I think it's more kind of a signal of the quality of her character rather than having a sort of ameliorative effect on her. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of, it's it's that, speaks to that sort of re refinement, which I think sort of pushes against how she's been conceived of uh, in cri other critical discussions, I think. Mm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Both papers were brilliant, by the way. I just wanted to say that as well. <laughs> Great. Any anybody else like to come in or something? And Joe, just so you know, your hand is still up. OK, no more. So anyone else? Well, can I just follow on from from Joe's question, um, I guess with a kind of a sort of connection between both, but really, uh, um, uh, Becky, the comments probably more directly to you. So, so Amanda, you're, you know, in terms of thinking about how that, um, that read in might be positive, you're, I mean, I guess you're through McDonald and so I'm thinking very much thinking about a theological frame for that, mm -hmm. so that it's not just, um, it's not just any conversation that's necessarily positive, but there's a, Kind of a, a theological conversation that that helped kind of develop and restore and transform so uh, becky the question for you that sort of follows from me on that is um when elliot goes to those sort of different theological examples if that's the right word um to think about sounds um so uh does she does she see anything um Kind of valuable or positive in that um in the in that kind of sort of theological language as a way of thinking about sound so you spoke really nicely about kind of maggie um and thomas Kempis and and how kind of sound and attention is is part of that and i suppose i was then um also mm -hmm. thinking about you know the preaching scene and and kind of adam bede um so you know we can see that kind of Elliot goes to theological examples as she thinks about attention and sound and there's i'm sure many many reasons why she does so um i guess the question for you is what does the sort of you know the theological realm or register do for Elliot? um if you've got any thoughts on that yeah um it's a, it's a really good question um and i would be uh grateful if anybody uh, else has um more of a kind of grounding in in the kind of theological framework um i think i talk about this kind of form of listening across Elliot's other novels and at points she kind of draws on this sort of theological framing in articulating um you know these kind of set listening events and at other points she doesn't um and i th i wonder whether it's more to do with kind of how do i put it sort of drawing on a tradition that might be familiar to a kind of reading audience um but again, so you have, you know, this war I've kind of uh, termed imminent transcendence. So you have the two sort of models of thoughts, this kind of scientifically grounded materialism uh, alongside this and kind of working through this theological um, frame. Um, but I mean, I, I guess, I, I guess for Elliot, if something is doing the work of great art, no matter what avenue whether theological or scientific that it's kind of being passed through um it it's a good thing because it's getting towards this kind of the realization of this sympathetic project i guess mm -hmm. 
So then just to to follow up then, you're thinking in terms of those, you know, those kind of theological examples for Adia are, you know, examples that her audience are thinking of, there are ways in which kind of transcendence seems to be operating and then her area of interest is to kind of to tease out the sort of imminent qualities and properties of that. Is that is that how you're thinking about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think there's quite a productive tension between those kind of two modes um, in her writing. Um, yeah, there's a, there's very much a consciousness of, of this 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 quality of uh, bodily perception that seems to allow for experience that goes beyond the kind of uh, I suppose parameters or, or, or confines of of the physiological, I guess. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Um, anybody else? So other questions anyone would like to raise? So again, you can put your hand up, put a note in the chat, whatever you would prefer. Um, Joe, let's come back to you. Great. Just something prompted by what uh, Mark's comment there. So Mark said um, that not any kind of conversation is regenerative in terms of Amanda's paper. Um, I kind of got the impression it was, <laughs> mm -hmm. or that there's a sense that all conversation is to some degree has a. If the imagination is the kind of the realm of the Holy Spirit, then there's a sense in which that it, it it's not a kind of doctrinally led or an or, or a kind of personally personal scent led um indwelling of the holy spirit there's a kind of sense that all imagination all conversation will have something regenerative so i just i would just wonder what i'm under hmm. adjudicate no um. not that. <laughs> <laughs> well joe is this, this round no um i think that I, yeah i think that i think that's right um i think kind of fundamentally in McDonald's thinking is the idea of, I mean, if you put it into a binary, it's kind of like, um, you know, it would be like focusing on yourself or, you know, selfishness or whatever is, you know, the opposite of attention and focusing on the other. And those, the, that's kind of the primary um, moral or spiritual uh, direction, I guess. Um, so to some extent, I think attention is kind of, you know, could be said to be sort of like a fundamental good for him, attention, like out, out kind of outward facing attention. That doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, if you're focusing on something bad, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. So it probably needs to be nuanced a little bit. Um, and then I guess as far as the imagination goes, I think that's right. I think he makes a distinction between fancy and imagination and fancy is kind of a little bit, fantasy doesn't lead you to truth, you know, um, but imagination does. So. I think that that's kind of an important distinction to make. And I think he tends to he tends to focus on air on the positives, which means that he he definitely critiques. But I think his. Um, I think he wants to kind of he tends to like wax eloquent about, you know, these wonderful things that you can read and these people that you can have conversations with, which is great. Um, but then I think it kind of requires a little bit of. Uh, reading in between the lines to get at some of the the nuances like, like, like you're talking about. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your, yeah. answers the question. Both. <laughs> cool, brilliant. Thank you, Jay. Um, John, let's go over to you. I, yeah, I guess it's just the, in a sense, this is the simple question around gender, um, how far that's important mm -hmm. in what you're talking about. I suppose, you know, in the conventionally, traditionally, the uh, site uh, is ma masculine, uh, listening is feminine, um, and then the apron over the head, again, my, the apron suggesting kind of female uh, attire and so on. And then there's the tradition of the bat coal, the daughter of the voice, the, Jew the Jewish tradition of hearing the voice in the street, this is the voice of God, um, which again is feminine. Um, and then obviously in, in uh, your talk, Amanda, the, the question of spirit or soul, if that were gendered as female, then otherwise there were a lot of he's in your discourse, weren't there? Uh, the Trinitarian he's for a start. Um, so um, I wonder how, yeah, the very, in a sense, gender plays out for both of you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, gender is... Um 
obviously significant in the character of Maggie, but um, more broadly in my reading of Elliot, don't seem to find that the kind of tradition of feminine listening really holds up. You know, think about Daniel Deronda, he's the kind of the best listener. And um, yeah, and I, and I suppose that maybe is to do partly to do with his kind of exceptionalism as a character. But um, I think, I mean, and I'm not sure whether I just don't want to perpetuate a sort of <laughs> a traditional model of feminine and masculine virtues in not finding uh, this idea sort of perpetuated. But um, I think that it's it's complicated uh, in, in Eliot's fiction and kind of across the Victorian fiction that I've been looking at, you know, there's quite a, an equal distribution of listening, I guess. Um, and I wonder, I do wonder whether that's partly to do with this kind of um, quite masculine attention to the science of sound in the in the kind of latter half of the, science, uh, of the 19th century, this kind of, the, the kind of uh, listening as a, as a sort of a signal of kind of aesthetic refinement, maybe that sort of uh, balanced the scales a little bit more suddenly men wanted to be seen as good listeners, I don't know. Um, yeah, picking up on, on your question, that's a very good question. Um, I think you're right in that, I think when when you're reading MacDonald's theology, it is it is masculine in the sense of, you know, he talks about the Holy Spirit in, um, in masculine terms as as he um but what was kind of i think interesting about him is so in his um in his fairy tales and in his fantasy he has these he has kind of this wise woman figure that crops up in a lot of his um in a lot of his fantasy stories and she is um she's kind of like the god figure and you know she's not it's not kind of a straightforward um representation you know, if, like she she could be kind of interpreted, obviously, a lot of things. But I think from what I understand, she's kind of um, she seems to me to be kind of the personification of uh, like wisdom and the imagination. And um, and, you know, there's that kind of uh, tradition, you know, in Christian tradition. I'm not sure if it's Joe might be able to. I'm not sure if this is also um, in Jewish tradition, probably maybe Judaic tradition, but um, of. Uh, of wisdom being personified, you know, in the proverb, I guess in the proverb, there's a woman, but also like the associations between that and um, Jesus or the Holy Spirit. So in his, in his fantasy work, he tends to be, like bring in the feminine, I guess, a little bit more than he does in his more kind of explicitly like nonfiction theology. But that didn't quite come across in this paper as much. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. We should um, draw this to a close. I think it's about two o'clock. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming along. Uh, really good to see all of you. Uh, and thank you for your questions. But um, thanks most of all um, to Becky and to Amanda for two absolutely fantastic papers. So um, yeah, well done. Thank you. Really enjoyed listening to them. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody.